Oh, well, thank you. I don't usually get that at Henry Ford College in Dearborn, Michigan from the 18 and 19 year olds I try to teach history to. So this is quite a, quite a nice change for me. This is, um, this is the second book in a trilogy on the Naval War College right after World War II, 1945 to 1947. This entire trilogy was originally supposed to be maybe a chapter or part of a chapter of the second book of my first trilogy. And the first trilogy was about the U.S.'s consolidation of control over the Pacific Basin between 1945 and 1947, where I was looking at the strategic rationale for building uh, a base system in the post-war U.S. Uh, and how exactly uh, the military services meant to uh, defend and administer the islands in the entire basin from uh, what the Joint Chiefs of Staff like to call a, resurg a potentially resurgent Japan or quote unquote any other power, which you can figure out who any other power was in 1945, 46, and 47. Uh, so this, that's my area, 1945 to 47. Uh, the rationale is I like to look at that early time period where containment is just starting to come into existence and just starting to gel into the containment doctrine. And I like looking at the Pacific, uh, in particular with the Naval War College, because of course after 1945, uh, the switch was to the Atlantic. And once the Soviet Union becomes the primary hypothetical enemy, uh, the reorientation is on the Atlantic. But I wanted to see what the Naval War College was doing with the Pacific in this transition time period, uh, in spite of the Soviet Union obviously starting to become the primary hypothetical enemy. <clears throat> for those not familiar, blue, I was asked blue, what's blue versus orange. Blue is the color coding for the United States. Orange is the color coding for Japan uh, in the fall and winter of 45 and 46. Japan was still the primary hypothetical enemy. The reason for that is uh, the war had ended so quickly the curriculum, I'm not sure about what goes on today, but the curriculum at the Naval War College then was set the year before. The war ended so quickly, they could not change the curriculum. Therefore, they went with the 44-45 curriculum. They changed things throughout the year when they could, uh, but the primary hypothetical enemy was still orange. Uh, you see about March, April of 46, you start seeing purple being brought in. And purple, of course, was the color code for the Soviet Union. Uh, and the next book is entitled Blue Versus Purple. Uh, and that's about the Soviet Union becoming the primary hypothetical enemy. So here we're still looking at Japan, which I decided to call the old enemy in the Pacific, given this transition. Um, Another, another reason for covering this time period, there's not a lot written about the Naval War College uh, after 1945. There, there are a few things, uh, especially done by John Hattendorf uh, and David Allen Rosenberg, but most of the history of the war gaming at the Naval War College has to do with the interwar period. Uh, and so I wanted to look at some detail in, in the post-war period and uh, obviously this is far from a comprehensive Cold War history uh, of the Naval War College. That still has to be done. Uh, but I wanted to look again at this early time period uh, in order to uh, find my mouse somewhere. In order to look at this sort of formative time period. That's of course a picture of the Naval War College about 1946. Um, by the way, if you're wondering why I'm not using PowerPoint, it's because I like to do things sometimes in old ways. I was born in late 1965. I increasingly become convinced that I was born about 40 years beyond the time period when I should have. This happens to historians a lot. They start figuring out they really should have been born in the time period they study and write about rather than one that they actually then came into existence. Feel how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. As, uh, as I advance more and more into middle age, yes, I am, I am learning these things. Uh, things my 
things my now deceased parents said to me make more and more sense uh, all the time. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is trying to communicate it to the 18 and 19 year olds so they have some perspective on all of this. Uh, Wargaming starts uh, in 1886 under uh, then Lieutenant, later on Captain uh, William McCarty Little, uh, who got the idea for naval wargaming uh, by the fact that the British, French, and German armies uh, had been doing wargaming uh, for quite some time in the 19th century. Uh, and I was just able to tour, thanks to Mr. Kennedy, uh, one of the modern facilities uh, and to see that to see that evolution to the electronic age uh, this is a this I apologize for the graininess of the picture uh, this is actually a picture from 1955 but it gives a good idea of what was going on in 1945 and 1946 uh, one of the things that I realized I was doing with this trilogy of books is really communicating a pre-electronic a pre-computer uh, way of wargaming, uh, which I think is one of the values of, of the book, uh, as well as the one that's going to be coming out uh, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, this is really just an entirely different way of having to look at how you do wargaming because you have no computers, so you can't do any of the visual or sound simulation that can be done, I would think, fairly easily today. Everything has to be made up. Um, a ship making smoke, uh, bad weather. Uh, you have to come up with all of this in a sort of analog way rather than uh, anything electronic. A uh, little bit about the college uh, at the time, uh, 45, 46. It's obviously just coming out of World War II and World War II was rather tough on the Naval War College because in May 1941, the Secretary of the Navy said, uh, we're not cycling enough officers through uh, we're going to have to turn the annual course into semi-annual, into a six-month course. Uh, because there were so many officers coming into the Navy that they had to be uh, educated and trained. Uh, however, the Naval War College took on a rather different miss mission uh, during the war. During the war, it was not educating mid-grade officers who were destined for flag rank. It instead became uh, an educational establishment for teaching the fundamentals of naval warfare, that's what they called it, to Army, uh, Marine Corps, State Department, foreign, and naval res junior naval reserve officers. So it took on a very different mission between about the fall of 1941 and the spring of 1946. It did not go back to the full year of instruction until the 46-47 academic year. So for five years, it was five to six month courses where they're trying to cycle through as many officers as possible through these fundamentals of naval warfare. For example, uh, June 43 to September 45, 337 officers cycle through uh, the Naval War College. Only 77 of them are naval officers and most of those were lieutenants. Uh, so they were, not, they were not being educated about strategic decision making as commanders of task forces or fleets. They were being taught the fundamentals before they were being sent out to the fleet or back to their service. Uh, the president of the Naval War College, Admiral Kel Kelfus, uh, was in fact so concerned about the Naval War College being downgraded. Um, I think he was also concerned about his rear admiralty being downgraded to captain. He, t he was able to convince the Navy to give him several other commands. So during the war, he not only commanded the Naval War College, he commanded the, uh, the NAS, Naval Air Station, the hospital, uh, the net depot, the torpedo station. Uh, about a dozen different commands were brought under uh, the auspices of Naval Operating Base Newport. Uh, so the book starts off where they're just trying to come out of that. There are still going to be six month courses, uh, one in the fall of 45, the other in the winter and spring of 46, um, but they're just trying to come out of that, uh, that really significant transition. Uh, if you haven't read the book yet, one of the things you'll need to slog through are the maneuver rules. These are several chapters where I, in detail, summarize and describe, really describe more than anything, um, 
how they operated. And the maneuver rules were these long and very detailed rules about how you simulated everything. Uh, how do you simulate an airstrike? How do you simulate a submarine operating? Including things like how long can the periscope be above water before it's discovered? Uh, I mean, these really, really extraordinarily detailed uh, kinds of rules. Um, there were also two kinds of maneuvers. There was a chart maneuver uh, and a board maneuver. Chart maneuvers were strategic scenarios that were played out by what was called the senior class. And I'm not sure if the Naval War College still has senior and junior classes. Senior class students were usually full commanders or captains or their equivalent rank in other, in other um, services. Uh, the more junior officers were lieutenant commanders or very junior commanders. And they were given board maneuvers, which were tactical scenarios. Uh, so very different kind of focus. And obviously, sometimes they were allowed uh, to war game together. Sometimes the more senior students uh, were allowed to be um, what was called the maneuver staff that would supervise uh, the exercise or the operations problem, as it was called. And uh, surprisingly, I found out that some of the students were allowed to, to do lectures uh, because given the experience they had from the war, uh, sometimes they had specialties that uh, perhaps someone on staff didn't. Uh, and this came about by talking with Dr. Chirpak very often because I'd run into names that I knew were students but were somehow titled on the lectures and I found out from her uh, that some of the students were allowed to do this. Um, when you conducted a maneuver or an operations problem, there was a maneuver staff. This was heavily, heavily populated, usually, uh, in fact, almost always dominated by the Naval War College staff themselves. Uh, there was a director of the maneuver, and the director of the maneuver had uh, fairly, in fact, dictatorial powers over making decisions about what was allowed during a maneuver and what wasn't. Right. A ship being sunk, aircraft being shot down, um, someone being able to carry off, say, a communications deception, anything that had to have a decision made as to whether it was really legitimate or not uh, had, to be, uh, had to get the permission of the director of the, manu the maneuver. There was also an assistant director usually for both sides, and these game war games were usually two sides, uh, in this case blue versus orange. Uh, so there was an assistant director for each, and then there were umpires. Uh, lots of them, and very often there were assistant umpires. There was a move umpire, a communication umpire, uh, an air umpire, a submarine, sorry, sorry about that, a submarine umpire, uh, and very often a torpedo umpire, a gunfire umpire, and very often they had assistant umpires. And in fact, if you look where Mr. Kennedy is standing back there, there is a display of a war game board back there that you can take a look at later on if you haven't seen it already and it shows several of the people positioned that would be positioned around it. Uh, there was a historian who recorded every single move uh, during the maneuver. Um, unfortunately, while they'd have critiques of the maneuver afterwards, no one wrote down the critiques. <laughs> So that would, that would have been gold for me as the historian to see written critiques, uh, but Dr. Chirpak told me they were all verbal in that time period. Uh, but, they wrote, but the historian wrote down every single actual move during the maneuver itself. Uh, there was a plotter and an assistant plotter. There were liaison officers, and messages were sent either by Marine Corps orderlies or by pneumatic tubes from one part of the building, uh, Pringle Hall, to another. And this is what I found most fascinating. Uh, you probably heard that in the late 19th century, women who worked on typewriters were called typewriters. Well, in this time period, we had damage recorders and damage computers. In fact, each maneuver had a staff of damage computers, and the senior one was called the chief damage computer, which I thought was just fascinating. This is a time period where the machinery is the person rather than the machinery. Uh, so it gives you some indication of how things were changing. Um, everything was done by filling out sheets and cards. 
torpedo fire cards. Right? I'm going to fire a torpedo during this move in the maneuver. Gunfire sheets. Aviation flight forms. I'm going to move my aircraft in this way during move one, mod two. Um, rules for damage. And there was essentially two kinds of damage. Rules for above water damage and underwater damage. Gunfire, torpedoes, mines, depth charges, bombs, rockets, torpedoes, machine gun, cannon fire. Uh, all of this was taken into account. There were all kinds of ways and rules in which you multiplied damage. Okay? Uh, and mathematically, I am completely illiterate. Uh, so I recorded things as well as I could in the book. I didn't always understand what I was uh, actually writing about. Uh, I hate to admit. Uh, but, it, you know, if you were mathematically inclined, uh, and I think the board shows some of those instruments that they used back there as well. Um, go down one more. Here's another. This is from 1946. Uh, and if you, there are pictures in the book showing uh, the maneuver room floor in Pringle Hall. Uh, if you haven't seen those pictures yet, it basically looks like a big college basketball auditorium. Uh, but it's all grids. And uh, you would set up the two sides on different parts of the maneuver room floor. You would put up black curtains to indicate where one side was supposed to go or not supposed to go. Uh, you would uh, use various kinds of devices to simulate smoke. Uh, you would instruct the students that where, where and when it was safe to discuss what they were doing for their strategic or tactical scenario. Uh, because if you're in the same room, you had to be careful about whether the other side was hearing what you were talking about or not. Uh, and there were rules about not talking in the hallways of Pringle Hall and things like that. Uh, again, it's all analog. It's all pre-electronic. So you didn't have to worry about bugs and viruses, uh, but you had to worry about uh, eavesdropping. Um, let me give you an example of some of the maneuvers that were carried out in, uh, in 45 and 46. Uh, and again, this is, this is literally September 45 to February 46. I stayed within that time period because after that they reoriented to purple in the Atlantic um, and I like to stay in the Pacific. Uh, but there was one uh, strategic scenario where a blue strike was going to be carried out in the North Pacific for one of two purposes. And this is Orange trying to figure out what blue is going to do. Uh, Blue is going to strike in the North Pacific either to assist in an amphibious assault on Hokkaido uh, or to seize a base in the southern Kurile Islands. Uh, I found that interesting because for a little while during the Pacific War, uh, the U.S. was considering invading Japan through the Kuriles and Hokkaido. They eventually decided against it by 1943 or so because of, for obvious reasons, climate and weather. Uh, but someone, I think, had, had sort of dug up uh, that old idea and turned it into a, uh, a, a chart maneuver, an operations problem. Uh, there was another scenario where a blue amphibious force uh, was being sent to seize Hainan Island uh, off the southern coast of China to establish a forward base from which an invasion of Japanese-held mainland China could be carried out. Uh, and I'm not sure if that was ever a scenario entertained during the war, uh, but obviously there were, there were ideas during the war about uh, how to get more assistance to the nationalist Chinese as they were fighting uh, the Japanese. And seizing Hainan is not too radically different than seizing Formosa, which was the primary naval strategy for when you got close, closer to Japan. Uh, in the fall of 44, the choice was, do we invade the Philippines or do we invade Formosa? And the Navy wanted to take Formosa and turn it into a base from which to interdict Japanese sea lines of communication uh, between their sources of raw materials in Southeast Asia and the Japanese home islands. President Roosevelt decided for the Philippines, um, 
I think in part because he didn't want to deal with General MacArthur, uh, but also there were political reasons for not leaving the Philippines further under Japanese occupation. And if you capture the Philippines, you can interdict those same lines of communication uh, as you can from Formosa. But seizing Hainan is not too radically different. Um, in one of these scenarios, there is a blue move toward the Philippines. Uh, and again, the idea here is to interdict uh, the slocks that Orange uh, is, is moving its merchant ships up from places like the Dutch East Indies to the Japanese home islands. Uh, if you can interdict those uh, sea lines of communications, uh, Blue in this case wants to do that as a way of trying to draw the Orange combined fleet out from Japan into battle so it can be decisively defeated in detail. Uh, there is uh, another one uh, where an orange force strikes east toward Hawaii from Micronesia, which are the islands in the Western Pacific, in order to carry out raids uh, on the Blue Pacific Fleet. Uh, and I found that one interesting because uh, before Admiral Yamamoto started talking about bringing Japanese carriers down from the northwest to strike Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese were all about moving from Micronesia east toward the Hawaiian Islands to engage the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And in fact, the U.S. Pacific Fleet was all about moving west toward Micronesia to do the same to Japan. So someone took really the interwar doctrine or, or the interwar uh, exercises uh, and put uh, an interesting um, sort of post-war spin on them. Um, Tactical scenarios, when I, when I first encountered some of these strategic and tactical scenarios, I was a bit at sea, no pun intended, until Dr. Hattendorf uh, really clued me in on, to an even greater extent, what the purpose of these exercises was. Uh, being a historian, I thought the purpose of the exercises was to replay history uh, and learn from that. It is, it is ultimately what we hope for, right? That's not the purpose of the operations problems. The operations problems was to create scenarios where the student officers were put under such stress that it would, it would simulate what was gonna happen if they were commanding fleets or task forces in strategic scenarios. So as he said to me uh, in, in a long email when I was writing um, the, the draft of this, the scenario doesn't matter. The, the historical setting, the, the, specifics, the specifics of the, of the scenario don't matter. What matters is that you create a situation where the student officers are put under stress and have to make decisions while they're under that kind of stress. And the whole idea of the, of the operations problem is to simulate that stress as much as possible. Uh, and he even uh, said, and this comes out in the book, uh, you don't have to play the game out to any logical conclusion one side or the other doesn't have to win. There are some scenarios where they do. The game only goes on until the director of the maneuver assumes or knows that any further learning isn't going to take place. In other words, have all the lessons been learned that can be learned uh, and then you can stop the game. Uh, so that was, that was a bit of a, a really a, a very different mindset because uh, I kept encountering um, what I thought at first were very strange kinds of tactical scenarios. For example, uh, in the Orange Strike toward Hawaii, uh, there are more Orange battleships, cruisers, and destroyers than Orange carriers. And in fact, carrier air power in this scenario is being used to support a large Orange surface striking force that's also operating west of Hawaii, and then, and then covering the withdrawal of that surface force back toward Micronesia. Uh, in the blue move to uh, interdict orange shipping in the South China Sea, orange repeatedly uh, enunciates concern about three blue Alaska-class battle cruisers. Right? There are carriers involved and, and so forth, but they, but they keep coming back to these battle cruisers. In most of the scenarios in this book, you usually have a blue force that consists of somewhere between 
one in five fleet carriers, fleet or light carriers, a larger number of battleships. In almost all of these scenarios, there's a larger number of battleships than there are carriers. And then you've got cruisers, destroyers, and sub some submarines. The orange forest usually consists of one or two carriers. There's almost always fewer orange carriers than blue. And then they also have a larger number of surface ships than carriers. All right, now, when I got into this, before I got into the primary sources, I thought, okay, they're going to be replaying 1944 and 1945, so I'm going to see 15 or 20 blue carriers going after about half that number of orange carriers and absolutely clobbering them. And instead what happens, in a very typical scenario, is the carriers go at each other, and they, in almost all cases, pummel each other into non-operational capability. And what's stressed very often is all you have to do to get a carrier out of combat is knock out its flight deck. If the flight deck doesn't work, the carrier's got to be sent back. So in a lot of these scenarios, carriers aren't sunk. They're just knocked out of action by having their flight decks demolished. But in, in most of the cases, the smaller number of carriers pummel each other into non-operational capability. So that you were left with, by the ends of the operations problems, a blue surface force fighting an orange surface force. And it's almost always during the day. There are almost no submarines operationally in these scenarios. And now taking it, I first had to take into account what Dr. Hattendorf told me. All right, the specifics of the scenario don't matter as long as what's being the stress that's being created. But I couldn't help but thinking, hmm, is the Naval War College in 1945 and 1946 replaying or still stuck to in a war doctrine where the battleships are the main force? Well, then I had to start reading some other historians who were looking at wartime doctrine. Because if you look at the plans by both Admiral Spruance and Admiral Halsey, I remember Admiral Spruance is a surface officer, but Admiral Halsey is a surface officer turned naval aviator. Both of them had doctrinal documents very similar to this. In other words, they were, com they were practicing what's called combined arms naval warfare. In 43, 44, 45, in almost all the operations they conducted, they didn't assume the carriers could perform all the missions. They assumed there were missions for heavy surface striking forces beyond just being anti-aircraft escorts or amphibious gunships. They assumed, or they thought, they might have to fight Japanese heavy surface striking forces. Uh, at some point in time. Um, when I took that into account, these things didn't seem to be so strange. Then, this is a picture of the Yamato being sunk. Then some other things happened. I had some more conversation. I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine, uh, a retired commander named Dennis Ringel. Uh, who taught for my college uh, for a little while after he taught, of all things, high school for 10 years. Uh, Commander Ringel, if you don't know, uh, wrote a book in the late 90s called Life in Mr. Lincoln's Navy. It was the first social history of uh, sailors in the Union Navy during the Civil War. And uh, Dennis fortunately reminded me as we were talking about this, oh, sorry about that, that it's 1945 and 1946, and the major thing happening to the military beyond demobilization are drastic, drastic budget cuts. Uh, because during the war, the military was about 80% of the federal budget, uh, and Harry Truman was a fiscal conservative, a real fiscal conservative, not like you know the kind we have around today. And he was drastically cutting the budget because he was worried about the national debt. And so Dennis reminded me that the Navy wasn't going to have all the money in the world like it had had during the war, and that perhaps that had to be taken into account uh, when you go into these scenarios. Uh, and of course, less money means 
less ships. Uh, then I started thinking about some other things, and I started reading uh, historians like Trent Hone, uh, who again has done a lot of research into um, into uh, the uh, into the wartime doctrine, and some other things started to become uh, rather apparent to me, or whether I was reminded of uh, one. It's 1945-1946. You don't know how long the occupation of Japan is going to last. In fact, in my first book, I covered a series of memoranda between uh, General of the Army Eisenhower and Fleet Admiral Nimitz. They were debating in 1947 uh, whether the occupation of Japan was going to last three years or five years but they assumed the occupation of Japan was going to last no more than five years. In fact, they also assumed that Japan was going to go communist as soon as, as, soon as the U.S. withdrew. All right. But if it is 1945-1946 and you, and you don't think that the occupation of Japan is going to last very long, then is it entirely ludicrous to think that perhaps Japan might rebuild and part of that rebuilding might be building a navy again? By the way, in 1945 and 46, the Joint Chiefs of Staff typically referred to future potential enemies as a resurgent Japan or any other power, which of course meant the Soviet Union. If you then start laughing and saying, well, the Russians didn't have a navy, no, they didn't have much of a navy, but uh, Stalin had been trying to build one since the mid-1930s. So if it is 1945 and 1946 and you've just been through World War II, can you assume the Russians are never going to build a fleet and never going to have a navy that could potentially challenge the U.S. Navy, at least in the Pacific or in the North Pacific? Then I had to start thinking through some other things, too. Uh, again, the idea of being short of money and uh, being short of ships. When the Korean War started, there were only two fleet carriers. In fact, there were only two carriers, period, in the Pacific Basin. There was one in Japan and there was one in Hawaii. There were more carriers, but most of them were in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic uh, because that's where the strategic focus was by that time. Uh, now, I then had to remind myself that in 1942, specifically in November 1942, there were only two fleet carriers left in the entire United States Navy and there were only two fast battleships in commission. There were, there were others in the pipeline, okay? Uh, the Essex-class carriers were going to come, but not till about the summer of 1943. And there was a slow trickle of, of the fast battleships out of the yards. But in the fall of 1942, and right around the end of the naval battles of Guadalcanal, U.S. Navy had really, really minimal forces. In fact, by early 43, U.S. Navy in the Solomons was using the destroyer as the main combatant because they had lost so many cruisers in the fall. They really didn't have that many left. So that brought up another idea. Maybe the war games are the way they are because the Naval War College is putting the students in a situation where they don't have all the ships they really need to carry out their mission. Uh, some other things came up. The focus on surface warfare. What in the world's going on? Uh, well, a historian from Hofstra University named James Levi came out with an interesting article a few years ago, I think in the Naval War College Review. He pointed out that of the 17 naval battles in the Solomons campaign, 42 to 43, 15 were surface battles. In fact, in the entire Pacific War, there were only five carrier on carrier battles. Two of them were fairly lopsided, right? Midway and the Philippine Sea. The other three in the fall of 42 were all fairly evenly matched carrier forces. Coral Sea, Eastern Solomons, uh, and then Santa Cruz. Oh, and in those three carrier battles, the carrier forces on each side pummeled each other into near non-operational capability. Another factor, Admiral Spruance takes over uh, as president of the Naval War College in March 
1946, from uh, Vice Admiral Pai, who'd been president from 42 to 46. Pai is a battleship admiral. In fact, he was the battleship commander of the Pacific Fleet on the morning of December 7th. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Spruance was a surface officer, but it commanded combined arms naval forces. Um, Spruance would throw things at the students like, um, what if we're up in the North Pacific and the weather's so bad, your aircraft can't fly? And in March 1946, the Navy sent some carriers up to the North Pacific in an operation called Frostbite. Yeah, right, the nickname's great. They wanted to test carrier operational capability in Arctic warfare, and they found the carriers were about 50% capable. Okay. And March, I mean, that's a pretty bad month, but it's not, probably not as bad as like January. So Spruance would say to his, both his staff and his students, what if you're up in the North Pacific and you're fighting somebody, right, a resurgent Japan or any other power, and your aircraft can't fly? What if you're up in the North and your radar doesn't work? How do you fight? And when I started taking those kinds of things into account, surface battles didn't seem so strange or anachronistic any longer. Um, what if, as Malcolm Muir talks about with surface warfare right after the end of the war, what if uh, the US Navy and an opposing Navy develop missiles? And do you get into a new kind of surface warfare, missile on missile, especially if you are up north? And remember, in the, in the spring of 46, the enemy becomes purple and almost all the scenarios are up in the Arctic Circle, whether in the Atlantic or the Pacific. There's, al there's almost nothing further south in either the Pacific or the Atlantic. Uh, so it's really clearly um, sort of an Arctic focus. Uh, and then I started thinking, okay, the purpose is to put these guys, and it was all guys then, the purpose is to put these guys under stress. What could be more stressful than resurrecting 1942, the worst year for the Navy in the Pacific War. And, and in fact, bring in elements of the fall of 1942, the battles around Guadalcanal, where forces were, if not evenly matched, the Japanese had superior forces, and create scenarios where these guys have to operate in those kinds of conditions. No, you don't have 15 fleet and light carriers. You've got two. And then you've got these surface ships. How do you carry out your mission? Because what's going to come about, I'm sure, is the $64,000 question. Were the admirals refighting the last war? And now my answer to that is, yes, of course they were. Why would you expect them not to? The war had just ended. That's what they were operating from. That's all, they, that's all they were operating from. And again, if you think that's anachronistic, understand it's 1945 and 1946. Nobody's predicting a Korea at this time. Nobody's talking about a Vietnam or a Persian Gulf War. They're sure not talking about a global war on terrorism. I mean, George Kennan's off talking about some operation, some brush fire operations, right? But George Kennan's not being listened to after about 1948. And he's the only one who's talking about those things. The Joint Chiefs of Staff in 45 and 46 and 47 think that the next war is going to be basically a repetition of World War II with atomic weapons. Hmm. If you look at the war plans and you look at the scenarios, they're almost all along those lines. Uh, read Stephen Ross's book on JCS plans between 45 and 50. And it's a really clear pattern. So NWC practicing interwar and wartime doctrine, I don't think it's out, that out of the ordinary. And I don't, think, I don't think it's out of the ordinary now if the generals and the admirals are looking at previous conflicts. Um, I think I finished about two minutes before I was supposed to. <laughs> We got about 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. I have a question. I've just I've often tried to picture this uh, 
you know, you, you talk about the fall of 42 as being kind of pivotal in, in terms of thinking and hard times. Yeah. But that's only, what, nine months after Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Yeah. And how long does it take today to make a battleship? Oh. Yeah. Or a carrier, yeah. or a submarine, yeah. and what we're churning out, and, <coughs> yeah. we, and we go from having our pants down yeah. to fighting and winning the war in what four years? Yeah, yeah, and in fact, except for except for salvaging the era, what was salvageable from the Arizona, and trying to turn the Oklahoma upright, I think it took about six months to repair the damage at Pearl Harbor. I mean, obviously not all of it, but it took a good and six even, months. And even then, that's and even I'm then, to try to do that today. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. One of the major points today, I think, is training people. You know, in World War II, you could take anybody and run a Liberty show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure the Liberty sailors would agree with that, but okay. Other questions? Or comments or snipes or, you know, anything? Yeah. I, uh, I was with Navy back in the late 80s, uh, Navy Reserve. Yeah. And we would train with NATO exercises over in Naples and uh, Sigonella. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, uh, and we did a lot of exercises, a lot of war gaming, I'm wondering if some of those officers there, uh, if some of the Naval War College training, either, either they filtered through here to learn some of this, or, or it filtered the other way from there over into the Med? I'm sure it did. I mean, I don't know the details. Unfortunately, Dr. Hattenberg's not here. He would have the real details on that, but I'm sure there were. In fact, I think one of my, I was, I joined the Naval Reserve in 88 as well, um, and I was, I was uh, in an intel unit. I was the personnel clerk. Um, but my last, my second to last CO was, I think, the first female XO and then CO of a reserve naval intel unit, and I think she did some exercises here at the Naval War College where she was a watch stander. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Input from uh, World War II Allied officers or even enemy naval officers, Japanese in particular, was that injected into <coughs> this particular wargaming scenario? Uh, it, it couldn't have been directly. I think it was too soon after the end of the war. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly American officers coming back. I mean, this, I mean their their actual operational experience. Uh, in fact, I would I would guess that the naval aviators were really frustrated officers because they had made the argument during the war, I don't think accurately, but they'd made the argument during the war that naval carrier aviation can do it all. I mean, Admiral, Admiral Towers just talked about, oh, you know, look, look at Spruins, he's playing games with the surface ships again. So I would imagine those folks were pretty stressed, frustrated because they had this idea that you really didn't need surface ships much of anything or, or much of anything else. Um, so I would think some of these folks are frustrated, but I think a lot of them were bringing wartime, wartime operations. They, could, they couldn't have not been thinking like that. Um, now, with the next book, when I was looking at the scenarios were purple, of course it became fairly well known during the Cold War, right? That how, how are the Soviets gonna try to fight the US Navy? They're going to use submarines with missiles and torpedoes, and then they're going to bring in surface ship. They're going to bring in naval aviation, land-based naval aviation with missiles, and then bring in surface ships. I think the Soviets got that from the Japanese because in a lot of these scenarios where the Japanese, where orange is short of carriers, how are they going to fight blue? Uh, they're going to use their small number of carriers backed up by land-based aviation. There was one point writing blue versus purple. I started thinking, did Owen I have a mole in Soviet naval headquarters uh, getting information on doctrine? Because blue versus purple in 1946 looked an awful lot in some cases like a, like a Cold War scenario from the 70s or the 80s, where, you, where you've got primarily a submarine force backed up by land-based aviation, and then <coughs> that's backed up by a surface force. So, yeah, there, I mean, there had to be operational experience being brought into this. I don't see how there couldn't be. I'm not sure it always got into the primary sources. Remember, somebody's recording the primary documents, so they're, they're probably being told what, maybe what to include, what not to include. Yeah, I think I saw another, yeah. I was just curious in a comment you made earlier in your presentation that you, you found no evidence of any debris for hot washout for 
any of the results of the war gaming. There was no, there were no that's written. The main, that's the main reason of gaming. Right. Is you put the forces together, make your moves, and then decide what you did right and what you did wrong. Critiques were being done. They were all verbal. <laughs> So I, so I have, in blue versus purple, I have documents. Here's, here's who's doing the critique, and here's what, you know, how it's going to be run, and that's it. Now, it's not that unusual if you think 1945 to 1947, because demobilization is so significant, a lot of things in the military weren't being done as they were being done at other period, time periods. Uh, for example, there's an entire year or two of the list of commissioned uh, naval officers that was never done. There was no listing for 1946. They were too busy demobilizing and getting going with the Cold War. So this might have been a time period where so many people were coming and going. It's, it's an extraordinarily difficult time period figuring out. When I write the books, I like to put in, this is Lieutenant Commander so-and-so, and he was doing this. It's very difficult figuring that kind of information out because from 45 to 47, very often, office rosters weren't, unit rosters weren't being completed. I mean, there was all kinds of a disruption. So uh, I'm not sure if written critiques were the norm before the war, uh, but in this time period. Now, there, there's another problem, too, and this could explain it. Uh, when I got here in, in 03 to do the initial bit of research, Dr. Chupak said, okay, the archives are a little spotty here and there. I said, okay. She said, in the 60s, there was a Mustang lieutenant who was the officer in charge of the archives. He'd been in the Navy for about 45 years. This was his last duty post before retirement. He saw it as his mission to clean up the archives. So a lot of stuff from this time period was thrown out. So, yeah. And you know, I like Mustangs. I mean, they were some of the best officers I served with in, in the reserve, so that was really difficult to hear. I saw a hand somewhere. Yeah. Five years after World War II ended, and we were the most powerful force in the world, yeah. the Korean War started, and we were probably pretty second by that time. Pretty? We, we, we were in poor shape. Um, compared to 1945, yeah, because the budget cuts had cut into the operating forces quite significantly. Um, but there was a pretty quick partial remobilization anyway. I mean, those, those two carriers quickly, I think, became six or seven um, once Truman had made the commitment to, to defend South Korea. Um, but today, my question really is, yeah. today, with atomic weapons, and Iran going to supply the ISIS and other people. Uh -huh. Are we in, are we going downhill fast? Um, <laughs> I'm from Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you want to talk about us going downhill, I'll give you all kinds of stories. It's got nothing to do with the state of our military. It's got to do with the state of our domestic situation. 49% my, my uh, colleague who runs our pre-education program tells me that 49% of the American population is functionally illiterate. Right. Right. Guess, guess what, sorry to get political folks, guess what happens when you put all your resources into the Cold War and you don't pay attention to what's going on at home. <coughs> and and, and my op I used to teach military officers part-time online for Marine Corps University. They didn't understand money until 2008. And in 2008, they suddenly figured out, oh, money matters. Mm -hmm. If you don't have money, if your civilian economy goes to hell in a handbasket, guess what? You don't have much of a military. So, you know, now also, do I see Iran as a threat? No, I don't. I see Russia and China as threats, which will need some military force to deal with. Um, but we better fix Detroit and 49% functional illiteracy and transition to a global information economy and not wait for the factories to come back and you know all those kinds of things uh, otherwise we you know <laughs> with 49 percent functional illiteracy where are you going to get people for your military that's um, another book it's not one i'm going to write it's too damn depressing and close to home yeah. yeah what what's your best guess of the naval war of the future 
uh, surface versus air um, missiles and the possibility of it being nuclear? I don't, I don't think it will be. I think what I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be somewhat of a resurgence of a Cold War with, with Russia, I almost said the USSR, with Russia and, and the PRC. Um, and I don't, so I don't think, I don't think it's going to go hot, but I think there's going to be a lot of posturing and, and uh, maneuvering and maybe even some bumping and shouldering, like, like when the U.S. went into what the Soviets said was territorial waters to carry out intel operations and the Soviet warships would, would bump and try to shoulder out the, the naval units. So I don't, see a, I don't see a war going hot because I think <coughs> atomic weapons nuclear weapons still exist. And, and I think if that's the case, then, then the great powers won't get into an actual shooting match. I could be wrong, hopefully I'm not. Um, but I certainly see a resurgence of a Cold War uh, of some sort on the Eurasian rim land uh, because I think the Russians want their Eastern European sphere back and I don't think we should allow that. And I think the PRC wants to push the U.S. back to Guam, and I don't think the U.S. should allow that, um, and I don't, I don't think will. But so, another kind of Cold War. Yeah. Sir, any emphasis on a particular arm, like a, especially those, especially that's accurate, the submarine campaign is wrapped up, the strangulation campaign, or a particular no. arm being. No. But you do, you do see certain kinds of arms being brought in more. For instance, in the next, in the next book, Blue versus Purple, there's more of submarines, uh, with Purple using them to strike carrier forces uh, and, and Blue using them to, to oppose Purple surface forces. Um, although I think, again, in Blue versus Orange, I think maybe there aren't submarines because you know there were operations in the Pacific War where the submarines were off doing other things and they just weren't available to commanders. So. Yeah, yeah, but they don't, they don't really come into the actual scenarios because the scenarios are more tactical than that. Um, all you know is they're not available to you and they're, they're off doing other things. <coughs> yeah. So oh, as, I'm sorry. as you look at some of these things in, in your perspective, which is <laughs> what makes it interesting for us, so much of warfare becomes really reactionary based on what you know. Yeah. And now, what are we doing? We're introducing something new, these drones. Yeah. That yeah. And there's no reason why that can't go to sea. Right. Well, they are. They already are. Uh, all right. Yeah. And so there's a whole new area that can really have quite an impact, and that yeah. can get up to speed a lot faster than an aircraft carrier. Yeah, you could even have robots fighting robots, which brings up some really interesting, for me, some really interesting Star Trek-like scenarios. Well, you never know. <laughs> In the blue shirt, yeah. Uh, I just recently read uh, that some a previous blue versus orange war game in, in between World War One and World War Two. Okay. Uh, they discovered uh, as they were trying to figure out a campaign against Japan. Yeah. Yeah. They discovered they had no way of landing. Yeah. Craft. So right. I, right. Presumably from some of these games, they came up with amphibious tractors, which I. That's when you know, play heavily into World War II. Yeah. Um, did you get any insight from the period that you that you studied and wrote on if they came up with any other you know light bulb uh, things that they applied then to Korea or? Uh, um, not so much in the war games themselves. In the lectures that were being done at the Naval War College for the students, you get a lot of either the instructors or guest lecturers or sometimes even students coming in and talking about, you know, this is what we learned from the invasion of Tarawa, uh, that kind of thing. Um, no. No. And in fact, uh, in Blue versus Orange and in Digesting History, the book that came out, there's very little on atomic weapons. Uh, Spruance is talking about it a little bit. It was a thesis topic, but he also emphasized when he had the staff and students try to tackle the thesis topic, there's almost no information. It's too classified. Not helicopters. Yeah, right, no, but I was using, I didn't see helicopters, but I didn't see much in the way of nuclear weapons either. Not until, not until uh, 46, 47. 
then you start bringing them in because of course anything post July 46 you have photos from Operation Crossroads so you have some something to work on helicopters nothing yet nothing like that so the new technology is very very slow coming in because it's just too classified yeah I'm uh, curious after the games during the period that you were studying here did you see any evidence of there were discussions that would happen here at the college about how accurate the rules were, that they needed to be changed, hmm. that they weren't really modeling the simulation well enough? One, I think that wasn't their main focus. Because again, I think the main focus was creating a scenario of stress. Two, in the maneuver rules, they do try to, they do try to make everything equivalent, right? I mean, there's, there's maneuver time, for instance, versus what we would call real time. So I think there was an attempt to do that. Um, I didn't see any shenanigans being played, like, like the Japanese before Midway resurrecting uh, sunken carrier. I think I might have seen that in one, one scenario. Uh, so I think there was a real conscious attempt not to try to redo or rewrite things that way. Um, but I think their focus was really entirely different, which again surprised me. I thought they were going to be, re, you know, historically replaying things in great detail, and that that didn't seem to be the focus at all. Uh, it was it was a, really a totally different kind of intellectual exercise.